Howdy, howdy, my fellow gamers, and welcome back to another episode of Storytime with Freak. Today, we read chapter 19 of Neil Shusterman's Thunderhead. Without further ado, let's get right into it. I often ruminate on that day, a century from now, when the human population reaches its limit. I ponder what must happen in the years leading up to it. There are only three plausible alternatives. The first would be to break my oath to allow personal freedom and limit births. This is unworkable because I'm incapable of breaking an oath. It is the reason I make so few. For this reason, imposing a limit on birth rates is not an option. The second possibility would be to find a way to expand human presence beyond Earth, an extraterrestrial solution. It would seem obvious that the best escape valve for a top-heavy population would be offloading billions of people to a different world. However, all attempts to set up colonies off-planet, our moon, Mars, even an orbital station, have met with unimaginable disasters that were entirely out of my control. I have reason to believe that new attempts will suffer the same disastrous end. So if humanity is a prisoner of Earth, and the birth rate cannot be throttled, there's only one other viable alternative to solve this population problem, and that alternative is not pleasant. Currently, there are 12,187 scythes in the world, each gleaning five people per week. However, in order to bring about zero population growth once humanity reaches the saturation point, it would require 394,000 429 scythes, each gleaning 100 people per day. It is not the world that I ever wish to see, but there are certain scythes who would welcome it, and they frighten me. The Thunderhead. Chapter 19, The Sharp Blades of Our Own Conscience. It had been over a week since their meeting with Scythe Constantine, and neither Citra nor Marie had performed a single gleaning. At first, Citra thought that having a respite from daily gleaning would be a welcome thing. She never enjoyed the thrust of the blade or the pulling of a trigger. She never enjoyed watching the light leave the eyes of someone she had given a lethal poison. But being a scythe changed a person. Over this first year of her full scythehood, there had been a reluctant acquiescence to this profession that she had chosen her. She gleaned with compassion, but was good at it, and she had come to take pride in it. Both Citra and Marie found themselves spending more and more time writing in their scythe journals. Although without gleaning, there was less to write about. They were still roamed as Marie called it, moving city to city, town to town, never staying anywhere for more than a day or two, and never planning where they would go next until they packed their bags. Citra found that her journal was beginning to resemble a travelogue. What Citra didn't write about was the physical toll this idle time had been taking on Scythe Kiri. Without the daily hunt to keep her sharp, she moved slower in the mornings. Her thoughts seemed to wander when she spoke, and she always seemed tired. Perhaps it's time for me to turn a corner, she mused to Citra. Maria never mentioned turning a corner before. Citra didn't know what to think of it. How far would you set your age back, Citra asked. Scythe Curie feigned considering it as if she hadn't been thinking about it for quite some time. Perhaps I'd set it down to 30 or 35. Would you keep your Hillary silver? She smiled, of course. It's my trademark. No one close to Citra had turned a corner. There were kids back at school whose parents reset their ages left and right as the mood suited them. She had a math teacher who had come in after a long week and looking practically unrecognizable. He had reset down to 21, and other girls in class tittered about how hot he was now, which just creeped Citra out. Even though setting down to 30 couldn't change Seth Curie all that much, it would be disconcerting. Although Citra knew it was a selfish to say, she told her, I like the way you are now. Marie smiled and said, Maybe I'll wait until next year. A physical age of 60 is a good time to reset. I was 60 the last time I turned a corner. But now there was a game afoot that might be breathe life back into both of them. Three gleanings, and all during the month of lights in the old-time holiday seasons. Like the three ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future, mostly forgotten in post-mortal times. The spirit of the past meant little when the years were named, not numbers. And for a vast majority of people, the future was nothing but an unchanging continuation of the present, leaving those spirits with nowhere to go but oblivion. Holiday gleanings, chimed Marie. What could be more old-time than death? Is it terrible to say that I'm looking forward to them? Citra asked, more to herself than to Marie. She could tell herself that she was really looking forward to luring out the attacker, but that would be a lie. You're a scythe, dear. Don't be so hard on yourself. Are you saying that Scythe Goddard was right? That in a perfect world, even scythes should enjoy what they do? Certainly not, Marie said with appropriate indignation. The simple pleasure of being good at what you do is very different from finding joy in taking life. And then she took a long look at Citra, gently held her hands, and said, The very fact that you are tormented by the question means you are a truly honorable scythe. Guard your conscience, Anastasia, and never let it wilt. It is the scythe's most valuable possession. The first of Scythe Anastasia's three gleanings was a woman, who chose to splat from the highest building in Fargo, which was not known for its high buildings. Forty stories, however, was more than enough to do the job. 
Scythe Constantine, half a dozen other scythes, and an entire phalanx of the blade guard hid themselves in strategic locations around the rooftop, as well as throughout the building and the streets around it. They vigilantly waited on the lookout for the murderous plot beyond the scheduled murderous plot. Will this hurt, Your Honor? The woman asked as she looked down from the edge of the icy, windswept roof. I don't think so, Scythe Anastasia told her. And if it does, it'll only be for a fraction of a second. For it to be an official gleaning, this woman couldn't leap on her own. Scythe Anastasia had to actually push her. Oddly, Citra found pushing the woman off the roof far more unpleasant than gleaning with a weapon. It reminded her that the terrible time when she was a child that she had pushed another girl in front of a bus. Of course, the girl was revived and in a couple of days was back in school as if nothing had happened. This time, however, there would be no revival. Scythe Anastasia did what she had to do. The woman died on schedule with neither fanfare nor incident, and her family kissed Scythe Anastasia's ring, solemnly accepting their year of immunity. Citra was both relieved and disappointed that no one had come out of the woodwork to challenge her. Scythe Anastasia's next gleaning a few days later was not quite as simple. I wish to be hunted by Crossbow, the man from Brew City told her. I ask that you hunt from sunrise to sunset in the woods near my home. And if you survive the hunt without being gleaned, Citra asked him, I'll come out of the woods and allow you to glean me, he said. But for surviving the full day, my family will receive two years of immunity instead of just one. Scythe Anastasia nodded her agreement in the stoic and formal manner she had learned from Scythe Kiri. A perimeter was set up to mark the boundaries within which the man could hide. Again, Scythe Constantine and his team monitored for intruders and any nefarious activity. The man thought he was a match for Citra. He wasn't. She tracked him and took him out less than an hour into the hunt, a single steel arrow to the heart. It was merciful, as all of Scythe Anastasia's gleanings were. He was dead before he hit the ground. Yet even though he hadn't made it through the day, she still gave his family two years of immunity. She knew she'd catch hell up for it in an enclave, but she didn't care. Through the entire gleaning, there was no sign of any plot or conspiracy against her. You should be relieved, not disappointed, Scythe Kiri told her that night. It probably means that I was the sole target, and you can rest easy. But Marie was certainly not resting easily, and not just because she was the probable target. I fear this goes beyond just a vendetta against me or you, Scythe Kiri confetted. These are troubling times, Anastasia. There's too much violence afoot. I look for the simple, straightforward days when we Scythes had nothing to fear but the sharp blades of our own conscience. Now there are enemies within enemies. Citra suspected there was truth in that. The attack on them was a small thread in a much larger tapestry that could not be seen from where they stood. She couldn't help but sense that there was something huge and threatening just beyond the horizon. We're switching over to Grayson's point of view now, after an ellipsis. I've made a contact. Agent Traxler raised an eyebrow. Do tell, Grayson. Please don't call me that. Just call me Slade. It's easier for me. All right, then, Slade. Tell me about this contact of yours. Until today, their weekly probation meetings had been uneventful. Grayson reported on how well he was adapting to being Slade Bridger, and how effectively he was infiltrating the local and savory culture. They're not so bad, Grayson had told him. Mostly. To which Traxler responded, Yes, I found that in spite of the attitude, unsavories are harmless. Mostly. Finding then that there were the ones who were not harmless were the ones Grayson was drawn to. The one. Purity. There's this person, he told Traxler, this person who offered me a job. I don't know the details of it, and I know that it's in violation of Thunderhead law. I think there's a whole group of people operating in a blind spot. Traxler took no notes. He wrote nothing down. He never did, but he always listened intently. Those spots aren't blind anymore once someone's watching, Traxler said. So does this person have a name? Grayson hesitated. I haven't found out yet, he lied. But what's more important are the people she knows. She! Traxler raised his eyebrow again, and Grayson silently cursed himself. He had been trying as hard as he could not to reveal anything about purity, not even her gender. But now it was out, and there was nothing he could do about it. Yes, I think she's connected with some pretty shady people, but I haven't met them yet. They're the ones who we should be worried about, not her. I'll make that determination, Traxler told him. In the meantime, it would behoove you to go as deep as you can go. I'm deep, Grayson told him. Traxler looked him in the eye. Go deeper. Grayson found... That when he was with Purity, he didn't think about Traxler, or his mission, he just thought about her. There was no question that she was involved in criminal activity, and not just pretend crimes like most inseveries, but the real thing. Purity knew ways to fly beneath the Thunderhead's radar, and taught them to Grayson. If the Thunderhead knew all the things I did, it would relocate me the way it did you, Purity told him. Then it would tweak my nanites to make me think happy thoughts. It might even supplant my memory with completely. The Thunderhead would cure me, but I don't want to be cured. I want to be worse than unsavory. I want to be bad. Honestly and truly bad. Yeah, I never thought about the Thunderhead from the perspective of an 
unrepentant savory. Was it wrong for the Thunderhead to rehabilitate people from the inside out? Should evil people be allowed the freedom to be evil without any safety nets? Is that what Purity was? Was she evil? Grayson found he had no answers to the question swimming in his head. How about you, Slade? She asked him. Do you want to be bad? He knew what his answer was 99% of the time, but when he was in her arms, his whole body was screaming with the sensation of being with her in that moment. With a clear crystal of his conscience fractured in a jade, his answer was a resounding yes. The third of Scythe Anastasia's gleanings was the most complicated to accomplish. The subject was an actor by the name of Sir Alban Aldrich. The Sir was a fictional title since no one was actually knighted anymore, but sounded much more impressive for a classically trained actor. Citra had known his profession when she had chosen him and suspected he would want a theatrical end, which Citra would be more happy to provide, but his request surprised even her. I wish to be gleaned as part of a performance of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, in which I will be playing the title role. Apparently, the day after she had selected him from gleaning, he and his repertory company had dropped the show they had been rehearsing and prepared for a single performance of the famed Mortal Age tragedy. The play holds so little meaning for our times, Your Honor, he explained to her, but if Caesar doesn't just pretend to die, if instead he is glean and the audience witnesses it, perhaps the play will linger with them as it must have in the age of mortality. Scythe Constantine was livid when Citra explained the request to him. Absolutely not. Anyone could be in that audience. Exactly, Citra told him, and everyone there will either work for the theater group or have pre-purchased tickets, which means that you can vet everyone before the night of the performance. You'll know if there's anyone there who's not supposed to be. I'll need to double the contingent of undercover guards. Xenocrates won't like it. If we catch the culprit, he'll love it, Citra pointed out, and Scythe Constantine couldn't disagree. If we go through with this, he said, I will make it clear to the High Blade that it was at your insistence. If we fail and your existence is ended, and the blame will be yours and yours alone. I can live with that, Citra told him. No, Scythe Constantine pointed out. You won't. We have a job, Purity told Grayson. The kind of job you've been looking for. It's not exactly going over the falls in a raft, but it's a thrill that's going to leave a whole lot of legacy. It was an inner tube, not a raft, he corrected. What kind of job? He found himself as where as he was curious. He had been accustomed to the pattern of life now, the days moving through unsavory circles and the nights of purity. She was a force of nature as deadly as it was in the old days, a hurricane before the Thunderhead knew how to diffuse its devastating power. An earthquake before it knew how to redistribute its violent shaking into a thousand small tremors. She was the untamed world, and although Grayson knew her, he saw her in absurd shades of grandeur. He indulged it, because lately indulgence was what it had become about. Would this job change that? Agent Traxler had told him to go deeper. Now he was so deep in his own unsavorism, he wasn't quite sure he wanted to come up for air. We're going to mess with everything, Slade, she told him. We're going to mark the world like animals do, and leave behind a scent that'll never go away. I like it, he said, but you still haven't told me what we're going to do. Then she smiled, not her usual sly grin, but something much broader and much more frightening, much more alluring. We're going to kill us a couple of scythes. And that concludes chapter 19. Thank you all for tuning in. Feel free to leave a like, comment, subscribe. Check out the links down below in the Twitter, the Twitch, Join the Discord. Let me know if you're a fan of the series. And as always, stay freaky.